dealer here, and this is a little antiderivative R and R, just to get you ready for those um, antiderivative tests that maybe you're taking tomorrow. Who knows? All right, so we have our classics, right? Antiderivative of x cubed dx, and like we've been saying in class, right? You pump up the power, or pump it up, and then you divide by the pump. Got to love that, right? Don't forget to divide by the pump. So many people forget to divide by that pump. So another example, you might be going to say, well, okay, well, what about if I was like the cube root of x squared? Ooh, you think you're fancy? You're not fancy, right? Because we know that that's the same thing as saying x to the two-thirds dx. And then lo and behold, here we go. Pump up the power, right? Pump it up. And then you divide by the pump. Well, two-thirds plus one, of course, you all know and love to be five-thirds. But when you divide by five-thirds, it's like multiplying by three-fifths. And, of course, do not forget the C. Don't forget that constant. All right? So you're like, okay, well, I got that. I got that. And don't forget some of the special cases, right? One over X dx, okay? You can't really pump that power up because negative one pumped up to zero, will give me zero, and you can't divide by zero. That's just crazy talk, right? But you do know that the antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural log of x. And, of course, we throw them in absolute values just to ensure that we're taking the derivative of a positive. Be careful if you have something like this, the sign of, let's say, 4x dx. We know whose derivative gives me sine. Of course you know that. That's cosine. True statement? All right. So that's the cosine of 4x. But don't forget the negative, okay, because we know the derivative of cosine is a negative sign. So the antiderivative of sine, you've got to bring the negative involved there. The other thing you have to be careful of is that you have an inside derivative of this guy of a 4. So that's when we talked about that little u sub thing. If I let u equal 4x, right, then du is equal to 4dx. You've seen pictures. So dx, of course, is du over 4, which means that dx is going to have a 4 when I get it replaced with du over 4. So just don't forget about that. And I'll do some more u subs in a, in a later screen. But when the u sub is just simple like this, it's a cute little derivative of an angle that's going to pop one out, just remember the inside derivative pops out in the denominator, um, and then we just break it down that way. All right, so those are just some cute little quick ones. And, of course, don't forget the derivative of, you know, antiderivative of secant tan, right? Antiderivative of secant tan, of course, is secant. Okay, so we kind of got those ones hopefully down pat. Um, and now let's look at these. Oh, look, already done. Look at that. Isn't that great? Okay. So, we have from 1 to 3 of f of x equal to 2, from 3 to 6, f of x equal to negative 5, 2 to 3, f of x equal to 1. So, we got that going for us. And yes, this f of x is a continuous function, it's differentiable everywhere, blah, 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 blah. We got all those, okay? All our little checks. So, if I'm going from 1 to 6, well, you think about it, if I piece from 1 to 3 together, and then 3 to 6 together, I could actually get the integral from... 1 to 6. So 1 to 3 is 2, 3 to 6 is negative 5, so negative 3 is my answer. Look at that, right? This 1 to 2 one, now he's a little trickier because I don't have an integral that's going from 1 to 2, but I got one that goes from 2 to 3, and then I have an antiderivative that goes from 1 to 3. So if I can flip this and I can say, well, if I go from 1 to 3, then I add on 2 to 3. I lied. I add on 3 to 2. Sorry about that. Okay? But just remember, if I flip these limits of integration, which I did here, then I also have to change the outside of that integral has to become negative. So technically, I'm taking from 1 to 3 and subtracting 3 to 2 is kind of what's happening here. All right? So 1 to 3, that's my 2. Got that. And then I'm bringing in from 3 to 2, which was 1, but remember, I have to take its opposite. So, lo and behold, I get a 1, okay? And then, of course, if you have some kind of constant sitting out front of it, the 4 can slip on outside that integral. That's the beauty property, right? Just slips on out. That k just pops on out of there. And I end up getting 4, and then I go from 1 to 3, which, oh, by the way, remember that was 2. And so I get an 8. So my answer is 8. All righty? Now, the ones that kick everybody, they're always sitting there going, well, how, when do we know that we need to do 
a u sub, right? And as I was saying in class, guys, if you got to do a u sub when the when you you have basically a product sometimes sitting inside of an integral. Um, remember that stuff inside the integral is called the integrand, right? Fun to say at parties, right? And basically, when a function's derivative is somewhere else, if that makes sense. So let, if I let u equal x squared minus 5, then du is going to equal 2x dx, which is going to make dx equal to du over 2x. And if you see this x, that is going to cancel with this x. So when I pull in the u sub, I still have my x. I still have my x. I lied. I still have my u. Sorry about that. Let's just use the eraser. Sorry. So that becomes a u to the one third power, and then dx is actually du over two x. So I can get rid of my x's. That's cool. One half he slips on out, and now I'm back to the old pump up the power, divide by the pump, right? So I pump up the power. One third becomes a four thirds. Then, of course, when you divide by four-thirds, it's like multiplying by three-fourths. You've seen it all. all. right? And then, of course, you can't leave things in U because you started with X's. So you start with X's and with X's. So I get three-eighths, and then I'm looking at X squared minus five raised to the four-thirds power plus C. And there you go. And that is the antiderivative of x times the cube root of x squared minus 5. So just remember that. Like if you, you know you've got to pull a u sub when you have something that, like something else is going on, you know? So for instance, if I have something like, let's say I'm sitting there going cotangent of x. That's always one that kicks people, right? Well, there's no derivative that's going to get me cotangent. So I have to think to myself, okay, but I know a few things about cotangent. Way back in the day, you learned cotangent is cosine over sine. Right? So if I let u equal sine, then du is cosine. dx, of course. Which makes dx equal to du over cosine of x. So you're like, okay, well that's cool. So now check out your integrand. It's the cosine x sitting over a u, and then I have a du cosine of x, which is awesome because now my cosines can cancel. And now I'm just left with the du over u. But whoa, ho, du over u, that's a natural log of u. And of course, since my u is sine x, I'm going to get the natural log of sine x plus c. How's that one for you? Does that work? I hope it does. All right, the last but not least is what if you have some limits of integration, right? Let's not forget. Okay, so we're dealing with those limits of integration. Sorry about that. I got cut off there for a minute. Okay, so let's just say you have an antiderivative that's saying we're going to go from like 1 to 3, and you have an x squared over, I don't know, x cubed plus 1. Not very exciting, but we're going to act like that is. Okay, so you notice the derivative of my x cubed is sitting right there, like a multiple of it is sitting right there. So that's kind of the key. So if I let u equal x cubed, sorry about that, plus 1, my du, lo and behold, of course, is 3x squared dx, which makes my dx equal to du over 3x squared. Now, I'm going to take this and just substitute on in. So my x squared, he's just chilling, my u's chilling, I get du over 3x squared. So all's good. Goodbye, goodbye. Slide the one-third out front. So we're looking at a one-third antiderivative of du over u. Now, the kicker here is making sure you change your limits of integration. If x is 1, then my u is 1 cubed plus 1, which is called 2. If x is 3, then my u is 3 cubed plus 1, which is 28. I had to think about that, right? So now I'm like, okay, the antiderivative of du over u, you remember that guy, he's the natural log of the absolute value of u, and you're hitting him from 2 to 28. So my one-third, he's just hanging around for the party, and I got the natural log of 28 minus the natural log of 2. But way back in pre-cal, actually algebra 2 probably, you learned 
that natural log of 28 minus the natural log of 2 is actually the natural log of 14 because when you're dividing, excuse me, when you're subtracting two logarithms, of course, it's a quotient of those logands. There's that word, logand. We're going to make it stick. I'm telling you people, we're going to make that word stick. Anyway, this could also be turned into the natural log of the cube root of 14. So either one of these answers is totally legit. Notice there is no plus C when you have the limits of integration, so don't forget about that. All right? The other thing, guys, don't forget, make sure you, under, make sure you remember how to take the antiderivative of e to the x. Oh, yeah. It's e to the x. Ah, oh, you got to love that. All right, this is the math dealer signing out. Have a